Chapter 18 of the Boy Scouts on Swift River by Thornton W. Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Plimpton's Story By means of the rope which Woodhall's foresight had provided, Lewis was at once lowered into the pit. He quickly looped the rope under the arms of the unconscious boy, and, lifting him up, gave the word to pull. As it came to the surface, eager hands reached to tenderly lift the limp body and lay it on the coats which Hal had spread on a smooth place. While the guide and Hal once more lowered the rope for Woodhall and pulled him out of the hole, Walter bent over the senseless form of his comrade. "'Thank heaven it's only a faint!' he exclaimed as he felt the weak but rapid pulse and noted the colorless face. He at once slipped a big stone under the feet so as to elevate them higher than the head that the blood might run toward the brain. Opening the boy's coat and shirt, he sprinkled chest and face with water from his canteen, and then, as Lewis appeared, called for spirits of ammonia from the first aid kit in Woodhall's knapsack. Meanwhile, he briskly rubbed Plimpton's limbs toward the body. With the application of the ammonia to his nose, Plimpton's eyelids fluttered, then slowly opened, and a wan smile parted the colorless lips. It was plain that the boy was suffering from shock and exhaustion as well as from the faint, and Woodhall quickly prepared a hypodermic injection by dissolving one fourteenth grain tablet of strychnia in ten drops of water. This he injected into the outside of one arm between the elbow and the shoulder. The patient showed a marked effect almost immediately. The action of the heart became stronger and the little color began to creep into his face. Meanwhile, Walter and Hal kept up a brisk rubbing of the limbs to restore circulation. By Woodhull's orders, the guide had built a brisk little fire of dead wood, and by the time Plimpton was sufficiently himself to sit up, a steaming cup of pea soup, made from the herbwurst, was ready for him. "'My, that tastes good,' he said as he sipped the hot stimulant. "'I knew you fellows would come. Did you find my signs?' "'You bet we did,' replied Hal heartily. But tell us, old scout, how did you come to get lost, and how did you happen to fall into that hole? You'll do nothing of the sort, Woodhall broke in. I'm the doctor now, and I forbid the patient to excite himself by talking. Camp's a long way off, and when we get there, there will be time enough to hear the story. In the meantime, I want you to rest quietly and get some strength for the trip down. All right, doctor. It was silly of me to faint away. But when I knew you fellows had come, I, I, well, things went black all of a sudden. This soup goes right to the spot. Another cup? He broke off abruptly and sniffed suspiciously. What's that that smells so awfully good? He demanded. His comrades grinned delightedly. Be patient, son, be patient, said Woodall. Don't gulp that soup down too fast. It's bad for the digestion. That is just an appetizer, and breakfast will be served in a few minutes. Will you have your steak rare or well done, or will you just take it as it comes? He added as the Indian appeared from behind a big boulder with a piece of venison done to a turn. Even the guide laughed at the look of mingled astonishment and delight on the hungry boy's face as the hot steak was laid before him. For the next ten minutes he was too busy to talk. When the last scrap had vanished and he had washed it down with a cup of hot cocoa. He announced now that he was ready to get lost all over again, in proof of which he started to get to his feet. Ouch! he exclaimed as he sat down suddenly. What is it? demanded Walter anxiously. Just a bit dizzy, replied Plimpton. I guess I started too quick to get up. I got a bit of a bump on the back of my head when I fell in that hole, and my head still feels a bit queer. "'I should say you did,' exclaimed Walter, parting the hair in the back of Plimpton's head. "'You had license to feel dizzy. Here's a great big lump and a two-inch cut.' Woodhall made a careful examination of this and concluded that it was nothing serious. The cut had stopped bleeding, and Lewis carefully washed it out with clear water, made sterile by boiling, and then cutting away the hair immediately around the cut, for this purpose using the scissors in the emergency kit. He applied a Red Cross sterilized dressing and bandage, with the use of which all the boys were familiar, as good scouts should be. When the job was done, the patient insisted that save for bruises and a strain in his right leg, 
he felt as good as ever. Preparations were at once made for the trip to camp. Plimpton proved to be more lame and stiff than he had thought. More than once he was glad of a helping hand in getting down over the ledges. He was game, however, as both Walter and Hal noted, and there was no complaint, although more than once they saw him wince when he thought he was unobserved. Now that the load of anxiety was lifted from his mind, Woodhull could think of other things, and he remembered the bear for the skin and meat of which he was to have gone that morning. He had said nothing about the success of his hunt the day before, and in the excitement the boys had asked no questions, probably taking it for granted that the venison they had was of his killing. A plan for a feast and jollification now occurred to him, and he drew the guide to one side and outlined his plan. The latter nodded his head in agreement, and soon after they hit the main trail he disappeared. At first the boys didn't miss him, and when they did, Lewis simply explained that he had gone on ahead. As a matter of fact, Lewis had arranged with him to go over to the hunter's camp on the pond and get the meat and bear skin. It was well past noon when they reached camp, for on account of Plimpton they had traveled very slowly. All were as hungry as wolves, and there was an immediate yell of protest when Lewis suggested a light lunch. But he told of his plan for a grand feast that night, after which they would have a roaring campfire, at which time Plimpton should tell his story and he should tell them of his hunt. And they hailed the idea with enthusiasm. By the way, Lewis, where's that deer you got yesterday? Al suddenly demanded, looking about the camp. That's so. Where is it? cried Walter. Lewis shook his head. It isn't, he replied. I'm sorry to disappoint you fellows, but the truth is I didn't get one. That venison you had this morning was a present. Then, noting the looks of disappointment and fearful that the boys would lose interest in the proposed feast, he added, But I think there's more where that came from, and I am almost sure that I can promise you a venison roast. If one of you will try for some fish, I'll take my rifle and see if I can shoot the heads off a braise of grouse. Walt, I for one wouldn't mind some of those spider biscuit of yours. The prospect of a real game dinner in the woods, with a real Indian guide to tell hunting stories in the firelight afterward, Woodhull had assured them that the guide would stay, spurred the boys to enthusiastic planning. Plimpton was appointed camp guard and, despite his protests that he wanted to do his share, was sternly ordered to devote himself to seeing that the camp did not run away. Woodhull took his rifle and went in search of the grouse. Hal rigged his rod and, with a supply of crickets and grubs, started for the riffle where Walter had such luck with the bass. Walter went to the village to see what he could find at the store in the way of canned fruits, cookies, pickles, etc. Walter was the first to return, and he at once set about preparations for the dinner. Plimpton insisted on helping and brought in the firewood as fast as Walter split it. Hal was the first of the sportsmen to show up. He had three fine bass. "'Your crickets were no good today, Walt. "'The fish wouldn't even look at them,' he said "'as he took them down to the water's edge to dress. "'Got all three on a spoon.' "'The boys had heard several reports of a rifle, "'and they were not surprised when Lewis came in "'and threw down three rough grouse, "'each neatly decapitated by a bullet. "'These he dressed and turned over to the chef "'while he himself picked up the axe "'and went in quest of logs for the campfire.' "'Looks like a real game dinner, even if we don't have the venison,' said Walter as he planned his menu. "'And I have an idea that that's coming right now,' said Plimpton as the guide appeared on the trail. The guess was a good one, for when the Indian reached the camp he laid down the forward part of a saddle of venison and two big steaks. "'Phew!' exclaimed Walter as he looked at these in dismay. "'I confess I don't know how to cook that unless it's cut up.' "'Don't worry about that, Walt.' said Lewis, coming up at that moment. John here, indicating the guide, is meat chef for tonight. You tend to the fish and other things, and he'll take care of the meat. The Indian built his roasting fire where the campfire was to be in order to take advantage of the huge backlogs Woodhull had provided. Against these he built a big fire of split hardwood. Splitting the backbone so that the roast would hang flat, he skewered thin slices of fat salt pork to the meat so that it would be continually basted. By means of a stout, wet string, the meat was suspended in front of the fire so as to get heat reflected from the backlogs. A dish was placed beneath the meat to catch the drippings, 
and the meat was set twirling so as to get the heat evenly on all sides. From time to time the Indian basted the roast with the drippings from the dish, and every now and then he gave the roast a fresh twirl. When it was nearly done, he raked some clear coals to one side, and over these broiled one of the steaks and the grouse, the latter being split. Walter had been no less busy. He had made biscuit, and then prepared the fish for frying, wiping each piece dry with a clean towel. A kettle of pea soup simmered over the fire. Plimpton, who was rather clever with his pencil, had busied himself preparing little birch bark menu cards. At the top of each was a little sketch of a camp with a mountain towering above. Beneath was printed the place and date, and then the following menu. Pea soup, camp style, fresh fried bass, pickles, olives, grouse a la Mount Tucker, steak de Bruin, roast venison Indian way, Tuckerville peaches, crackers, biscuit, cookies, cheese, cocoa, milk, water. Woodhull had discovered what he was doing, and under pledge of secrecy had let him into the secret of the bear steak in order that the menu might be complete. Strange to say, no one noticed the name of this course. Although between mouthfuls Hal remarked that the steak didn't taste at all like that they had for breakfast and wanted to know if it came from another part of the critter. It was when, stuffed to the limit, there was a general loosening of belts and relaxing into sprawling, comfortable positions, that Walter picked up his car to run over again the list of forest bounty. A puzzled frown puckered his brows. "'I don't quite see the point of this steak de Bruin,' he said. "'What does it mean, Plimpton?' "'Ask the chef. He's responsible,' replied Plimpton. Woodhall had already signaled a guide, and the latter had slipped away unnoticed. As Walter and Hal turned to Lewis, the guide returned and dropped at Woodhall's feet the bear skin with head attached, which had been hidden in the brush nearby. "'Just my little contribution to the feast from this fellow,' said Woodhall, his eyes twinkling while the guide grinned broadly. For the space of a full minute Walter and Hal stared with jaws dropped and eyes in which incredulity struggled with belief. Then they fell upon Lewis. "'Foxy Grandpa!' "'Where did you get him? "'Why haven't you told us about it? "'Oh, Mr. Tightmouth, "'got anything more up your sleeve?' "'Over and over the three rolled on the ground "'until breathless and weary "'the younger boys were shaken off. "'I promised you the story of my hunt tonight, didn't I?' "'Lewis demanded. "'But you won't get it until camp has been put in order for the night "'and Plimpton has told us about his experience on the mountain.' There was a general hustle to clear things away. The campfire was lighted, and then sprawled on blankets before the leaping blaze, the boys were ready for the stories. "'There isn't much for me to tell that you don't already know,' began Plimpton, the glow from the fire lending some color to his pale face and bringing into sharp relief the white bandage around his head. "'When we hit the steep grade below the ledges, it got my wind, and the muscles of my legs, and I couldn't keep the pace you fellows were setting.' You know I'm pretty green at that sort of thing, he added apologetically, turning to Walter and Hal. Well, I got farther behind than I had any idea I had. I kept thinking I'd find you fellows waiting just ahead. And when I didn't, I began to hurry without paying proper attention to the trail. All of a sudden I found there wasn't any trail. I knew I couldn't be very far off it, and I thought I could pick it up in a few minutes. But the more I looked, the less idea I had of where it ought to be. It must be that at the point where I left it, it makes a sharp turn. The guide nodded. Well, then I lost my head, resumed the boy. I yelled and listened, but heard no reply. That was because we were over the ledges and the sound traveled in the other direction, Walter broke in. I guess that must have been it, though I didn't think of it then, agreed Plumpton. By that time I was scared good and plenty, and I began to run. My first idea was to get up higher, but of course I made the wrong turn, and I found I couldn't climb those ledges to save me. It was kind of dark down in the woods below those ledges, and the stillest place I was ever in in my life. Every minute I got more scared, and I didn't have any more idea than a hen in which direction I was running. Two or three times I fell headlong. Each time I scrambled up and, and plunged on again, barking my shins on logs and stumbling over sticks and stumps. I sure was in one awful panic, Plimpton grinned at the memory. 
I guess I'd be running yet if my breath hadn't given out. I got a stitch in my side, and I just had to slow down. Going slower that way gave me more chance to think. But when I began to think, I grew more scared than ever. I remember that someone had said that there were wildcats up on those ledges behind me, and I got to looking for a bear to jump out from behind every windfall. Oh, I've got the finest imagination you ever dreamed of. And about that time, it was working full speed with the high gear thrown in. Thinking of bears reminded me of honey back there at Woodcraft Camp. And that led me to think of Billy Buxby and the story of how he got lost and spent a night in the woods last year and the good sense he showed. Right there, I began to get a grip on myself. I began to remember the things I had read and heard about people lost in the woods. All of a sudden, I heard Dr. Miriam's voice. It said, Sit down and think it over. I heard it just as plain as if he was right beside me. Well, it seemed to me that I couldn't sit down. I just had to keep on going. But finally I came to a log and I did sit down. And then, to keep myself from jumping up and running again, I cut a stick and began to whittle. I made up my mind that I would sit there until I had whittled it all up. That explains those whittlings, exclaimed Hal. I meant to ask you about them, for I couldn't figure out what they were to save my life. That was the wisest thing you could have done. It was good scout craft, said Woodhall. Go on. By the time I had that stick whittled up, I'd begun to get a glimmer of common sense back in my head, resumed Plimpton. I knew that if I was out all night, you fellows would start hunting for me the first thing in the morning. Then I remembered reading the advice of an old woodsman to blaze a tree on four sides so that it could be seen from any direction. At first I thought I would camp right there, but there was a lot of daylight yet, and I wanted to get myself out of the scrape alone if I could. So I decided to try and push on in a straight line, trusting the luck that I would hit a trail. Before I started, I made the crosses and the arrow on the tree so that if you found it, you would know which way I had gone. Then I went on slowly, trying to hold in one direction, and blazing the way as I went. By and by I hit a trail, and I was so badly turned around that I thought it was the main trail. I didn't know in which direction to go, but I figured if I went one way I'd get to camp, and if I went the other I'd meet Wald and Hal coming down, so that either way I'd went out. I felt pretty chipper about that time and hustled along until I reached the ledges. Then I knew that they were not the same ones where I had got lost, and that I was on the wrong trail. It was so late then that I didn't dare turn back, because I knew that it would get dark long before I could get out of the woods, and I shouldn't be able to follow the trail. I thought that if I kept on up to the top, that perhaps I could see camp, or at any rate get my bearings, so that in the morning I would know in which direction the back trail was taking me. Of course I knew that it would be cold and exposed on top, and I didn't intend to spend the night there. I meant to get back to the shelter of the woods before dark and build a fire and camp there. Well... When I got to the top, I couldn't see anything familiar, but by the position of the setting sun, I knew I was to the west of the main trail, and I guessed that I was on the west spur, and if I followed the trail back, I should hit the main trail. This made my mind easier, but just the same, I had a mighty queer feeling when I thought of camping all alone down there in the woods all night. While I was exploring the top, I came to that fallen pine, and of course I saw the hole exposed by the upturned roots. It looked interesting, as if it might be the entrance to a cave. And while I was trying to see into it better, I got too close to the edge. It caved in, and down I went. I just remember falling, and then nothing more, until I opened my eyes and wondered where it was. Way up above me, it seemed a mile high just then, was a patch of light, like a skylight and a roof. Of course, you fellows know that it wasn't more than ten feet above me, but but you see, I've been knocked unconscious for I don't know how long by this bump on my head, and my old top knot was sort of going round and round, and that skylight seemed to be part of a dream and terribly far away. By and by my wits stopped wool gathering, and I realized where I was. I was pretty sore, but there were no bones broken, and as soon as my head got steady enough, I looked about to see how I could get out. It was pretty dark down there, so I knew it was late. Well, you saw what kind of hole it was, sides almost straight. I was trapped. 
and when I realized it, I went almost crazy for a few minutes. I lighted some matches to see what kind of a place I was in. It seemed to be a sort of cleft between the rocks. The floor was covered with chunks of what looked like what we used to call rotten stone. It had fallen from up above, and I suppose it was this that had weakened the roots of the old pine so that finally it blew over and opened up that hole. Woodhull nodded. It probably was a conglomerate and disintegrated. It's often called pudding stone. The hole or cleft in which I was narrowed at one end to a passage just about big enough to squeeze through and then opened into what seemed to be a good-sized cave. I stuck my head in there and lighted a couple of matches and decided I'd stay where I was. I didn't have but two or three matches left, and I was lost all I wanted to be without taking any chances in the dark underground. Besides, it smelled terribly close and musty, and, and well, I, I saw some bones in there, and, and they didn't make me feel good a bit. Right under that little patch of sky was good enough for me. Ugh, I don't want to spend another night like that. Plimpton involuntarily shuddered. I slept some by fits and starts because I was so tired. I couldn't help myself. But every time I woke, I wondered if that cave was the den of a bear or a wildcat, and honest, I nearly cracked my eardrums listening for some beast to sniff at me through that passage. I knew a good-sized bear couldn't get through, but a wildcat could. One time I even made up my mind that it probably was a panther's den I had tumbled into. Oh, it's all right for you fellows to laugh. I can myself now. But I bet you wouldn't have laughed if you had been in my place. I bet we wouldn't have either, Walter broke in. There isn't much more to tell, continued Plumpton. I was warm enough down there, but half starved. Somehow the night passed, and when daylight came and I hadn't been eaten up, I began to feel better. I knew you fellows would find me, but it seemed a terrible while before I heard the first rifle shots and then it seemed as though you never would get there. I yelled until I didn't have any voice left. Finally, I heard Woodhull's call from the top of the mountain and knew that my troubles were about over. And then, why, then I, I just keeled over and didn't know anything more until I opened my eyes and found Walt bending over me. It was foolish of me, but I just couldn't help it. And that's all my story. For a few minutes there was silence, broken only by the snap and hiss of the flames. Then Woodhall spoke. "'Fellow scouts,' he said, "'I, for one, am proud of our tenderfoot. He lost his way, but he found himself. I'd like to feel sure that I should do as well under as severe a test. He didn't quit.' It seemed to Hal and Walter that there was just the least bit of emphasis on that word quit." but perhaps that was due to a little feeling of shame that they had harbored so long this feeling against Plimpton. Walter hopped to his feet. The Woodcraft yell for Ed Plimpton, the scout who lost the trail but found himself, he cried, and to the tenderfoot's blushing confusion, it was given with a will. End of chapter 18